Thanks. Thanks, Anne, for inviting me. Thank you all for being here and listening. Um, so, yes, yeah, so my name is Gideon. I edit MIT Technology Review. My background, I originally started out as a science and technology journalist at The Economist. Then they started sending me around the world, and I started covering different regions of the world, nothing to do with technology. Uh, and so I've wound my way back to the field over 20 years uh, in journalism. And because I think of that experience that I've had, I'm, I've always been intensely interested in this interaction between technology and society and the rest of the world. And now in particular is a time when people are talking about that interaction a great deal more because of the effects of technology on politics, which we're going to talk about um, on media and on communication in general, um, because of the issues that arise uh, when technology is applied to, for instance, medicine, to gen genetics and genomics. Um, our new issue, which is just about to come out, is about precision medicine, and it's about the impacts of big data and the ability to target treatments and medicines precisely at people based on their genetic makeup, how that creates lots of opportunities for medicine, but also creates uh, opportunities for unequal access to medicine because people's ability to get treatment will depend on what data is available about them, what access to resources they have, uh, and often treatments are very costly when they're very personalized. So it feels to me like this is a time when we need to be talking a lot more, and we are talking a lot more about technology and its social impacts, and that's why when the opportunity to edit Tech, tech Review came up, I jumped at it because it, fe it felt to me like being at a publication that's owned by a university, uh, which is a university of technology, and which has a, a belief in technology being a force for good, that a, tech, a publication like that is, a, is uniquely placed to actually try to lead that conversation. There's a lot of writing about tech and its impacts. Um, it feels to me like there's less slightly about well, first of all, a lot of the writing about tech and its impacts tends to be in a kind of either ut a utopian versus u dystopian dichotomy. So people are either tech is great or tech is terrible. Uh, we don't believe in either in that dichotomy. Um, I don't believe in that dichotomy. I think that technology is simply a very large force in our society. Uh, and it can be used for beneficial effects and for harmful effects. And our duty as journalists is to figure out how we can help it be used more for beneficial effects by informing the conversations between the people who take decisions around that. And by, un by revealing not only how the technology works, but how decisions around it are taken and what influences those decisions and what economic and social structures determine who gets to build technology and who has access to it and how it's used. So that is the background to why I'm doing things like this. The politics issue specifically and this is what I'm going to try to talk about today, is an attempt to unpack this, this weird paradox of how we got from a situation uh, five years ago when, we, when Tech Review had this cover, Big Data Will Save Politics, uh, and there was a lot of optimism around the possibility of technology to make politics more accountable, more transparent, um, give voters more of a voice, to this era we're in today where we feel like uh, our democracy is under assault because of, the, because of what technology has enabled, both in terms of the spread of misinformation, uh, the ability to micro-target voters uh, and manipulate them, uh, the ability of uh, extremism to flourish online. How did we get from there to here? And what I'm going to try to talk about is that and how that, how, I'm going to try to unpack those issues and also the issues of the role of media in all of this. And the question, which is the kind of the, the flip side, if you like, of how technology influences democracy, which is how do we regulate technology in a sensible way? What, is, what, what are the ways in which, if we think as a society, technology is having harmful effects, that we can mitigate those, that we can change the frameworks in, within which it's developed so that it has fewer beneficial effects? Because one of the big difficulties that we have right now is that the people who make policy for technology tend not to understand it very well and the people who build technology tend not to understand the policy implications very well. So that's what I'm going to attempt to unpack over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So in 2013, we ran this cover. Um, and this was right after Barack Obama had been reelected. 
And that was the mood in, at the time. Um, that you know, this was still also a couple of years after the Arab Spring. Uh, people were very optimistic about the power of Facebook to em to empower social movements, to give people a voice, to give to create online activism and organizing in a way that would be uh, that would would um, if you like decentralize political activity and uh, take power out of central institutions. Now, this cover also reflects the bias of of the tech industry of, of Silicon Valley. Right, most people here. Uh, were Obama supporters. And so if you were an Obama supporter, then sure, it looked like big data was doing great things for politics. Um, if you were a Republican, you might not have thought so. Uh, Obama, Obama's campaign really pioneered the micro-targeting of voters in the way that we know of it today, the way that was used by Cambridge Analytica uh, and by the Trump campaign, um, the thing that is now seen as, as manipulative and evil. That was what Obama was doing. They developed uh, enormous num amounts of data on the electorate. Um, Cambridge Analytica boasted that it had something like three or 4,000 data points on, on every US voter. Uh, and that was, you know, wow, how, how much data they have on us. The Obama campaign boasted of having 1,000 data points. So not, not an order of magnitude difference. Uh, they were already doing very sophisticated things. Um, what is the problem with micro-targeting? So in, in this issue, of tech review in the, in, the, in the current one, the opening essay is by uh, Zeynep Tufekci, who's a sociologist of technology. Um, and she makes the point that what micro-targeting does uh, when you, in other words, when you design ads, political ads that are very specific, uh, that go to each voter based on social media activity and on their profile, that figure out what messages they want to hear and that they're most likely to be influenced by. When you, do, when you make political advertising that targeted and that precise, the effect that it has is that it fragments the electorate. People are no longer all seeing the same information their neighbors see. They, are, uh, they don't know what their neighbors are, are seeing. They don't know what they're discussing. Um, it makes people, therefore, more susceptible to manipulation because each of them is, is now being targeted in a very specific way. Um, she says, it was a shift from a public collective politics to a more private scattered one with political actors collecting more and more personal data to figure out how to push just the right buttons, person by person, and out of sight. So micro-targeting makes political campaigning less transparent. It's less clear to everybody what is going on, um, not just because, as in the case of Cambridge Analytica and, and then Russian political advertising on Facebook, not just because you couldn't see who was sending the messages, but because it, you can't see the way in which those messages are being spread, who's seeing them, uh, and, and what impacts they're having. Another reason that this form of political action, uh, form of micro-targeting political campaigning, is toxic um, is that the algorithms on social media that determine what people see and that suggest what, pe what messages people should be sent by political campaigns. Turns out are driven, uh, those algorithms turn out to be uh, likely to, s to send people more extremist content. The things that travel well on social media are outrage. Um, and uh, there is a tendency for people to be drawn to, uh, there's a tendency for people to, to click on things that are more extremist and therefore the platforms show them things that are more extremist. There was a, a study specifically of YouTube content earlier this year that showed that the algorithm was surfacing more and more extremist videos as you, as you went deeper into a feed. Um, that kind of algorithm happened to be very well suited to a political candidate like Donald Trump who excelled at sending inflammatory messages and at stoking up discord. Uh, the other factor that played a role in this, of course, was that um, traditional media, which were, uh, had been the gatekeepers of uh, information and were determining the messages that people saw, those media have been getting weakened. Now, of course, this didn't start with the internet. Uh, in this country, at least, um, the fragmentation, the echo chamber effect of the media, media ecosystem began with cable news, um, the rise of uh, Fox, the increasing partisanship on TV still is probably a much bigger effect than, uh, face than social media are, uh, just in terms of reaching viewers. Um, but social media unquestionably contributed to this 
uh, this partisanship and this tendency for more extremist views to proliferate. Another, another part of this is that as the internet disrupted the business models of media, the media, the media organizations that suffered the most, that have been most driven to close, have been local newspapers, local, local media organizations. And those local sources, the closing of those, created something of, if you like, an information vacuum uh, that Russian political actors, for instance, were able to take advantage of. This is another of the points that Tufekci makes in her story. She says there were Russian uh, operatives who were creating f essentially fake local news organizations, giving them Facebook pages or even websites, putting stories out on them, uh, and seeding the discord that way. Um, this dependency on social media is something that really drove uh, journalism for, for quite a while. And it's shifting now because, well, it, it, it may be shifting now. We, we haven't seen the finish of it yet, I think. But as probably a lot of you know, Facebook was sending a lot of traffic to media organizations up until maybe, uh, I want to say, you know, some, some point in the past year or two, that traffic started to drop. Because Facebook, partly in response to the uh, discomfort that people had about the way that it was, uh, the, 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 the messages that were being shown on social media, Facebook started recalibrating its algorithm, showing people more posts from their friends, and family, fewer posts from brands and from publishers. So a place that, like Quartz, where I was working, or many of the new media outlets, we had been very, very dependent on social traffic. Uh, I think that was, you know, certainly there was a point when Facebook represented well over half the traffic that Quartz was getting. And because of that, a lot of these organizations, Quartz included, had refined a fine art of how to write stories in such a way that they would do well on social. So it meant everything from how you framed a story, what, what, what information you picked out as, as interesting that to, to make the headline, how you wrote the headline, um, <clears throat> and how you, distributed it on, how you distributed it on social. Um, so, uh, there is uh, one of the readings that um, I sent before this talk. Uh, and then another, another example of big data having an ever greater effect in this political discourse is uh, the use of bots. So uh, a few years ago, a bot on Twitter was uh, an egg-shaped profile with a weird handle like uh, ZPZ11444. Uh, and um, they were dumb. They simply retweeted uh, accounts automatically. They, they, they were generated in their thousands, and they broadcast information. Um, they were easy to spot. The place that we're heading to, um, writes one of our contributors, is a point when we will be able to use machine learning to build chatbots that can engage with people on social platforms directly uh, in response to things that they have tweeted or posted uh, and try to provide countervailing arguments or uh, you know, insert themselves into conversations in a very targeted and specific way. So that is, is another way in which the, um, the, the ability to use data analysis and machine learning um, allows you to influence the political conversation on a larger scale without, without so much human intervention. What this all adds up to is a situation where I think it's fair to ask, do people have political choice anymore? And do people even have free will anymore? So some of you probably Maybe all of you know the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari, um, who's written a couple of books about the history of humanity. And he has a concept now that he writes about called the hackable, the hackable human. And he says, we're now at a stage where people's, where the, the possibility of understanding and predicting a person's likely motivations and actions has become so sophisticated based on the data that we're, ga we're gathering on them that 
we can, we can predict many people's actions better than they themselves can predict them. We can essentially hack them. And we're giving social platforms and we're giving politicians the power to do that sort of hacking uh, at a scale that we've never had before. And that really takes away the whole notion of an election being a free choice based on information that is weighed by the electorate, which was always an idealization of what elections were, but it's now getting to a point where really the ability, to, potentially the ability to, to manipulate voters has, has gotten to a whole new level. So if that is the situation that we're in, where does this, where does this lead us? What, what is the future of our politics? So I'm gonna go for a little bit into a dark place. Um, Christopher Browning, the uh, historian, wrote a uh, piece not long ago comparing the situation that we're in today to the situation in the 1930s before World War II. And I think there's, there's probably many among us who have asked ourselves just how similar is today to back then. Superficially, um, it's, you know, being alarmist, it's very easy to feel as if we're entering a world where nationalism on the right is on the rise again, isolationism is on the rise again, uh, a trade war is starting, maybe a trade war turns into a real war, um, there is cyber threats flying back and forth. Uh, are, are we heading to a new, uh, new situation of global conflict? Browning addresses this in his essay, and he says the main thing to understand is the difference between today and the 1930s is in the 1930s, the, the demagogues and the dictators who arose were quite proud, quite unashamed of being demagogues and dictators. They, they said, we're totalitarians. They celebrated totalitarianism. Their message was, yes, we, we know best. We're going to run things. Uh, and that, for a while, appealed to a lot of, a lot of the population. Browning says, today, the difference is that what we're seeing is something that's called illiberal democracy. Um, these demagogues don't need to protect, don't need to embrace totalitarianism. They can maintain a, an appearance of democracy, uh, which is in the form of elections still continue, voters have notionally free choice, speech is free, uh, information flows, flows all over the place. But because of this ability to manipulate voters and because of the rise of extremist points of view, which are disseminated through the internet, uh, this democracy is increasingly illiberal um, and increasingly manipulated towards certain ends, which do not have anything to do with the, the liberal democracies of the last few decades. And the contribution that technology plays in this is what I've been talking about, and Browning also talks about how this affects the media. So the media, in uh, the media, were always supposed to be the the check on politicians going to extreme. Uh, Browning says, the highly critical free media not only provide no effective check on Trump's ability to be a serial liar without political penalty. On the contrary, they provide yet another enemy around which to mobilize the grievances and resentments of his base. A free press does not have to be repressed when it can be rendered irrelevant and even exploited for political gain. The ability of anybody to publish whatever they want online and the dynamics within social platforms that, that uh, encourage extremist views to be circulated, all of that contributes to this inability of the media to act as an effective check on power. The second item that I have on this slide is um, Scum of the Earth by Arthur Kersler, um, who was a Hungarian journalist um, uh, in, who um, became quite famous for the books that he wrote during the, uh, during, in between the wars and thereafter. He also became fi quite famous for some rather um, unpleasant things, such as uh, being a serial abuser of women. But he, at the time that he was writing this book, he was living in France uh, just before it fell, just before the occupation uh, by the Germans. Um, and he, the, the reason that I bring him up is that he writes about something that we would today recognize as echo chambers. That, well, that phrase didn't exist back then. But he wrote about uh, how the French newspapers um, became very partisan and adopted certain, certain viewpoints. And if you read certain newspapers, you were convinced that uh, there was a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world um, and that um, Hitler was going to free the peoples of Europe from, from this scourge. Um, so in other words, the the, situ the situation in which we're in today, the situation of, of echo chambers, of demagoguery, of 
people's opinions being manipulated is not in itself new. It just it's operating in a different medium. Uh, but the, but there are there are similar there are echoes, that, and that's why I bring that up. Um, I will actually uh, Timothy Snyder, who uh, is a, a contemporary historian. Um, wrote this book, The Road to Unfreedom. I'm actually, I'm actually going to skip over this, I think, because um, it's an interesting essay, um, and he talks about the different political styles um, that, uh, that represented Western uh, democracies versus the kind of politics that is taking over now, which he characterizes as uh, an implant from Russia, um, what he calls the politics of eternity. Um, uh, but anyway, I will, I will pass over this because we're running a little short of time. So, so the, but the broad takeaway that I want to give here is that we're, we're, now in a, we're now in a phase that can feel rather a lot like that politics of pre-World War II, which is isolationist demagogu demagoguery, um, very sharp divisions of opinion between people, um, a breakdown of a general national discourse. And unlike in those days of dictatorship, we're still performing democracy. We're still performing free elections and free speech and free interchange of views. Uh, but I'm contending that the choice of voters is beginning to look increasingly illusory under these conditions. So under that, those circumstances, it's, it's probably no surprise that when I go around talking to people about politics and about technology and about governance, uh, I increasingly hear people t asking about other systems of governance. And in, in particular, people in Western democracies, quite a lot of them are looking to China and saying, is the Chinese system better? Which is a very strange situation because a few years ago, nobody over here would have said, well, we should, we should run ourselves the way China runs itself. But something about that breakdown of democratic discourse, that feeling that, that democracy doesn't function in the way that it should have, combined with China's seeming ability to create fantastic economic growth and leap ahead in certain fields of technology, particularly AI and clean energy, is starting to look appealing to some people. It, China looks in some ways less dysfunctional. So there's a lot of discussion now about different models of governance. There's the Chinese, the US, and the European. And I've characterized them here in a very simplistic way. Obviously, this is simplistic. But it's, it's, uh, it's, I think, a framework for talking about what, what the differences between these regimes are and, and what people find appealing about them. So in the US, we have generally low regulation on business and low regulation on speech. Uh, you know, the low regulation on business is a little bit of a myth. Um, business is actually quite heavily regulated in some ways, not in others. There's a lot of regulatory capture. Um, but, you know, broadly speaking, that, that is the, compared with Europe, um, business is fairly lightly regulated. And freedom of speech obviously is enshrined in the Constitution, so there's very little regulation on the freedom of speech. In Europe, we have a lot more regulation on business. Um, there is regulation both at the national and the supranational level. Um, in the US, interestingly, there is a kind of direct, things are going in the other direction. The, um, I think one, one of the outcomes of the Trump administration is that states, in particular the states that are not pro-Trump, uh, are increasingly asserting their own rights, and states' rights, which was always a rallying cry of the right, is, is starting to become a rallying cry of the left. And I expect that we will see that over the next few years a lot more clearly. So in the US, it feels like the, the, the center of gravity of regulatory influence is starting to shift slightly, at least in certain respects, away from the feds and towards the states. Whereas in Europe, regulation is at the national and now the supranational level. Um, and there are also strong restrictions on freedom of speech. Um, not, well, sorry, strong is the wrong word, but there are, there are limits on freedom of speech which were designed essentially as a response to, to World War II. They're designed to try to keep hate speech from taking over. Uh, and um, GDPR, the uh, European Privacy Regulation, which we'll talk about in a second, um, is, contributes to some extent to that control of, of political speech. And then China, is, a, is an interesting environment where speech is very tightly regulated, political dissent is not very much tolerated, there's an incredibly sophisticated network of censorship uh, in, in order to try to limit the things that people can say online. Um, but 
regulation on business for a country that calls itself still communist is extraordinarily free. Um, and there is both an, a great deal of encouragement from the central government to certain sectors of industry, um, but also just a, a lot of leeway given to businesses, particularly in AI, uh, to experiment and to build themselves up. Um, and so one of, the, one of the outcomes of this is that there is an interesting division when you look at the uh, size of the tech industries uh, in the US, Europe, and well, the slide is Asia, but it, uh, a lot of that is China. Um, and what's been interesting but for me in particular about being here in, in Silicon Valley in the last few days is I've been talking to um, tech people who uh, point out things like this and, and they say, well, look, China's a great model. We uh, look at, your, look at, your, look at how, how little tech industry Europe has. That's what you get when you have regulation and GDPR. We need to be more like China in that respect. So this, there is this sense that on the one hand, sure, nobody wants to live in a repressive country that doesn't let you speak your mind. Uh, where technology is being used in an increasingly intrusive way, where there's surveillance of the population. Um, but on the other hand, wouldn't it be great if we could live in a country that could decide to take action on climate change, as China's doing? Um, or that can recognize that AI is a strategic industry and we need to invest in it, as the US government is not really doing. Um, and then, you know, there's that, so that's the kind of, the, that, that's the sort of libertarian the libertarian feeling about China, I think, that I, that I pick up a lot in certainly around here. Uh, and then if you, know, if you look at Europe, um, someone like me, a knee-jerk social liberal, will say, well, of course, I want to live in, I'd rather live in a European regime than a Chinese regime. Um, the GDPR is a, a good example of the recent move that Europe made to bring the tech industry to, to uh, put greater constraints on how the tech industry uses people's data. Um, and it includes requirements to limit people's data use, to be more transparent about what companies do with the data, tell people about data breaches. Um, here's a sort of summary of some of those issues. Um, do impact assessments on what, you know, when, they, when, they change, when a company does, changes the way that it works with someone's data, what is the impact of that on, on data privacy and protection. Uh, and it includes the, it enshrines the right to be forgotten, the right for, people's, for people to have data about them removed um, from from sight, from the internet. Um, and that seems like a very good model if you care about individual privacy and protection uh, in a way that is not being, that is not done certainly in China and not so much in the US either. Um, but is GDPR actually a better model? Is it protecting people? Um, theoretically, one of the things GDPR does is it gives you more control over how your data is used. And so all of you will remember that when GDPR came into effect in May, we all started receiving emails from all of these different companies saying, hey, we've got new terms of service, click here to consent. Um, you probably had the same experiences as me. You just had to keep on clicking consent. You probably weren't reading the new terms of service. You weren't, you weren't seeing what, what, how things were changing. The problem with a consent-based model of, of data protection is that it still puts the onus for looking after yourself in the hands of the user. And frankly, for most people, we have too much data about ourselves being used in too many ways for us to keep tabs on it effectively. Um, there are also worries about whether the right to be forgotten, the ability for data to be erased, is a way that could limit freedom of speech in some contexts. Um, uh, it also creates tensions between states that, for instance, want to use, use data about people to fight crime or fight terrorism or even fight Russian political manipulation. If it's easier for data to be erased, um, the, some of the evidence of those things can, can also be removed. Um, one of the people that I spoke to on this trip was Alex Stamos, who used to be um, Facebook's chief security officer, is now here at Stanford. Um, and he's, you know, he said, we're, the next European elections are going to be the first ones under GDPR. Uh, and we're going to see, find that the Rus Russians find that Article 17 of GDPR, which is the, the bit about the right to be forgotten, uh, is a great way for them to erase evidence of their political manipulation. So, that lead, you know, this raises that question of what, which of these, which of these systems is better. Um, uh, if we go back to the U.S., we're in a situation where um, 
we don't have a thing like GDPR to protect, uh, to, to try to combat hate speech and misuse of information online. Uh, and one of the results of that is that the pressure is on tech platforms to take charge of this for themselves, to, uh, um, to, to, take, their own, to take their own measures to restrict hate speech and police what people say without any legislative framework for them to do so. Um, and that, Alex Stamos also says, is, is a big risk because what we're doing is we're effectively saying to Google and Facebook, all right, you're responsible um, if someone is hurt by online speech. So do something about it. That gives them an incentive and license to create machine learning algorithms that can moderate everything that is posted in real time. At the moment, they require a lot of human moderation. A few years from now, algorithms will be able to do pretty much all of it very effectively. Do you really want Facebook or Google policing, listening, or moderating everything you say and deciding what you're allowed to post? And Stamos says that's the, that's the, the reality that we're heading for if we continue to insist that the tech platforms moderate, uh, limit, free, limit hate speech without giving them uh, a legal framework for doing so. What all of this, I think, comes down to is that we don't have uh, great models at the moment for how to talk about what, gov what the role of regulation should be for technology. We're in a world where technology is advancing very fast, regulatory systems move very slowly, uh, and the frameworks that we need in order to decide whether or not, um, for instance, how people's data should be used, how hate speech should be policed, how political advertising should be, should be done. We don't have good frameworks for, for setting the laws for this because legislators don't understand the tech very well, the people in the tech industry don't understand the ethical and social issues very well, and they're not talking to each other enough. But I think it's clear that there has to be a role for society and for government in setting those rules. If we, you know, in other words, I don't believe in the uh, model of simply letting the tech industry decide what is good for us. So the, pro the problem that we have is how do we set those rules as a society? And this is, for me, this is like one of the underlying questions that informs a lot of what I do as a journalist and what we're doing at Technology Review. How do we set reasonable terms of engagement and reasonable rules for what the tech industry does when it moves so fast but regulation moves so slowly. I think it's clear that the current model is somewhat broken. So another of the people that I s spoke to on this trip is uh, Tzvika Krieger who now is at the World Economic Forum. Before that he worked at the Defense Department and the State Department on a number of different things including, including tech related initiatives. And he said, I worked for years on policies that were obsolete the day they came out. So there is always that game of catch-up that is being played. So how do we, how do we overcome this, this lack of regulatory uh, capacity, if you like? There are two answers. One is the Silicon Valley Libertarian answer, which is, which I've heard from one of the, another person that I spoke to on this trip, which is, we don't need re regulation. The market is doing just fine. Facebook um, is actually experiencing a backlash from people for the way that it has allowed political manipulation to happen. Um, and uh, it will be replaced by the platforms. I'm, I'd be interested how many people here believe that. But there is that feeling that, yeah, pe people will ultimately make their choices and that will, that will sort us out. The alternative view is to say, no, we can't leave it to the free market, but we need new models for how to regulate. Um, so a little bit of our politics issue talks about those experiments. Um, there are experiments that, uh, there's an experiment being done, for instance, in Taiwan with participatory governance, where um, laws are proposed to deal with things like how to regulate Uber, um, or how to regulate online sa sales of alcohol. And uh, a machine learning system is employed to take opinions from people, and those opinions go into crafting laws that, that can reach a consensus where there was previously division. Um, and there are lots of experiments around the world, most of them pretty small scale in participatory governance, but there are certainly interesting experiments in how do you, how do you come up with rules for, particularly for tech industries, um, that are responsive to what people actually care about uh, and that can be drafted in a reasonably quick way. Um, one of, uh, so Taiwan is interesting because there were several cases where they had a complete impasse, for instance, over, over online alcohol sales. There was a total impasse on how to regulate these in such a way 
that would allow sales, alcohol to be sold online but wouldn't allow children to buy it. Um, and when this platform v Taiwan was brought into play, um, they managed to find a solution um, that everybody agreed to within a matter of months after, after years of deadlock. Um, Krieger at the World Economic Forum, uh, they're working on projects that look at how to implement new kinds of data management policy. So something that is not the free-for-all that we have here or in China, uh, but something that is not as tightly regulated as GDPR. Um, and they, so they, they're working with governments like the UAE and Rwanda and India to look at how can we set up policies for data management that, that give a reasonable amount of protection to people, um, and, but, but that also uh, give uh, reasonable freedom to the industry. Um, Stamos here at Stanford is working on the problem of how to bring together people from different sectors, from government, from academia, and from the tech industry, so that they can understand each other better, and so that there can be more research done into the influence the technology has. Um, one of the things he said to me is, there's no specific academic field studying the misuse of technology. Um, there, there, there's ex research into um, uh, bugs and exploits and cryptographic solutions. He said, but you can't get a PhD studying bullying and harassment and the technical solutions to them. You might have political scientists studying the impact of social networks on democracy. You might have people in the psychology department studying the impact of the use of Instagram on teenagers who are suicidal but they don't have the technical skills and infrastructure. So what he's trying to do here is build a, a lab, essentially, in which those kinds of studies can be done in an interdisciplinary way and then inform policy making. Um, and so we need that kind of research. We need, um, I think, more, more conversation between people from, uh, from the technology industry, from uh, the lawmaking sector, and from civil society. Um, so as I said, lawmakers are not very good at understanding technology, but people who represent communities that are affected by technology also, I think, at, the, at this point, don't yet have enough of a grounding in it to understand the ways in which it's affecting their communities. And I'm thinking of people like representatives of minority groups, union organizers, um, uh, any, any representative of marginalized groups. They often do not come from a tech background, and they're not yet seeing, I think, the ways in which technology affects their communities and how, and how they need to react. So all of that is really a way of touting what, you know, the mission that we have a technology review, which is um, what I'm trying to do with our, with our coverage is to enable more of those conversations between the different groups that decide the way that technology is built and implemented. So I call them the makers, the users, and the framers, the makers of technology, the users, which also means the people who represent the users, the leaders of community groups, and the lawmakers, um, and also the people who create financial frameworks, the funders. Um, if those groups can understand each other better and talk more about the common solutions, then I think we have maybe a better chance of, having, of developing technology in a way that has fewer of these harmful side effects. That's it. Thank you. I mean, I suppose the question is, what, what is a policy that encourages an identity? But I can, I, I mean, I, I think you, yeah, I suppose I could say all of those identities, but certainly uh, I think at the local level is probably where there might be more, the, the most opportunity. So, um, you know, you want people to have common discussion about things that affect their local community. So particularly local politics. Um, the role that local media used to play in that sort of discussion and in forming that sense of community identity has obviously been 
seriously damaged by, by the, the destruction of local media by, by internet business models. Um, and you know, I know people who think that there is still, that the, the cause of local, local media isn't hopeless, that people just, we just haven't figured out the right business model yet, and that there is a way to, to reconstruct that. So reconstructing local media and then thinking about ways in which you can get people at the local level engaged with community issues probably is a way of fostering local identity and making people feel part of a thing that, in which they have a stake. Um, that might have some sort of counteracting effect on that fragmentation of voters that I talked about with micro-targeting. Uh, so that, if, if there's gonna be one of those things that you want to focus on, that seems to me the most, the most fruitful. But you know, the, one of, one of the, obviously one of the effects of the internet is it encourages the formation of lots of different identities. And, in many ways very positive, right? It allows people to find their groups, their, their cohorts, uh, the people with whom they share things in common. Um, it allows people who are you know, marginalized in one community to find an, their online community. Um, so the, I don't think those identities are necessarily negative, um, but it's something about the ways in which the ways in which those, it's not so much about fi forming the right identities, it's, it's about the ways in which you in which companies and politicians and brands target those identities, right? If you are using, if you are trying to target someone's identity as a way to inflame them or to uh, isolate them um, or to, to create discord, then that is obviously very bad. Um, but if, there are, if, there are, if the business models of, the, of, of these tech platforms um, can allow for a more, for, for a different kind of relationship to people, then maybe it, it can be less harmful. Question: What's the place of high corporate and low speech? I know. Can anyone think of one? Sorry, which? The EU. The EU. Right. So, yeah, I mean, as I said, this is a very simplistic uh, description. So when I say that the EU has high speech regulation, it's not as high as China's by a long shot. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, yeah. Otherwise. India has an interesting case. <coughs> it's got high business regulation mm. and somewhat low speech. So you're starting to see, see the beginnings of that, and the question is how far it will go. When I, what I mean is more, more media companies are now trying to get people to pay for their content after several years when I once said, no, you can't get people to, to pay for content. How many of them will manage it? How many of them will be able to make a business from it? I don't know. But I think that for a lot of those companies, the fact that they saw their traffic from Facebook fall so precipitously when it did 
was a bit of a wake-up call. You can't just be so dependent on one source. So I think more people are going to try to, or more people already are, trying to diversify their revenue sources uh, and think about what can they do that provides enough value to their readers or to their audiences that people are actually willing to pay for it. Now, obviously, that shifts the, the balance of, you know, that shifts the economics of it because then people, the money that people are willing to pay is a finite resource, um, whereas previously it was attention that was a finite resource. So people are, compu people are competing on a, on a different playing field. But that's, you know, that, uh, that, that, that is just a different kind of competition. I guess kind of evolved, like, I was kind of curious, like, your thoughts coming from, like, the UK where it's a very robust, like, publicly funded kind of media organization, like, mm -hmm. uh, like, in China also, like, the state-sponsored news is, like, very popular, very widely read, like, generally well-trusted um, as a source of the news. So do you see, like, what do you see the role of like, government in kind of, like, meeting with this or providing a source of I guess I feel like it depends on the country. I can't. Yeah. I can't see the U.S. creating a BBC. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. Yeah. I, I, it, it feels like too too much of a culturally specific thing that some countries have it and some countries don't. There's a question. So you mentioned about how people are kind of beginning to realize that uh, the manipulated effects of data on their lives. So how much does that raise suspicion? You mean, you mean, are people trusting the information they get less because they, yeah, because I, it's based I mean, on? Like perhaps, I don't know whether it's true, but it seems to me that people perhaps don't trust the information that's given to them anymore, although it's tailored for their liking. So is that also kind of counter uh, force to what you're saying about uh, like micro-targeting? Good question. Uh, I don't know. I, do, do you think people are trusting the information they get less? I mean, it seems, it seems to me like people are, well, I, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, it would be an interesting survey to do. Do people trust what they see less than they used to? Um, but if, if they do, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure that for most people, the awareness of how information is being targeted to them would play into that. I think people, the cues that, that you have for whether or not you trust something depend on, you know, what is the source, where is it coming from, what kind of language does it use, what kind of assumptions are baked into the, the narrative that it tells you. Um, the fact that it was selected for you by an algorithm that you can't see is probably a, a much smaller consideration. Uh, you mentioned for the algorithm-driven news, uh, the one big problem is outrage. And because the, my understanding, um, the reason of outrage actually is and the human nature um, intention to click through to an extreme topic is headline. So all the algorithms um, um, optimize for that goal. And actually, calls actually use a different front end um, to push the news to the audience. Is there any different effort you guys try um, to optimize this, this problem? Or any other things calls try to solve? And what's the take? No, I mean, our front end was not algorithmic. We just published a list of stories. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't tailored to the user. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that was it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not that it's an, I mean, we try not to be an academic journal, right? We're trying to be a general interest journal. But because we're in part of an academic institution, uh, that means a couple of things. It means that the reason that MIT maintains technology review is not to make money off it. It doesn't care if it makes money. We would like it if it didn't lose money, but you know, it doesn't care if it makes money. The point of it is to have a high quality, respected publication that's associated with the name of MIT. Uh, and so they care about, you know, what impact are our stories having? Are they influencing policy debates? Are they changing the way that people think? 
Um, so that, that shifts our own incentives. Uh, we're not focused exclusively on can we make money off this business, but also why are we doing it and what, you know, what, what impacts does it have? So uh, one issue that comes up in a lot of these cases where you have algorithmic governance, whether it's like Facebook deciding what things you see or it's like trying to social credit system deciding what you can get a loan, is you know, on the first order there's a lack of transparency. You don't see why these decisions are being made, and that was highlighted in several of these articles. But there's this even higher order issue, which is there's no recourse. Right? Like in China, you can't then go back and say, well, I'm going to dispute this issue. But even more concretely, in the case of like YouTube and Facebook, you can't provide meaningful feedback to say, don't show me extremist videos. Right? I want to tailor my experience this way. So I guess the two kinds of questions there are like, have you seen examples of algorithmic governance where people have meaningful recourse to change the algorithm for themselves or for broader swaths of people? And do you think also this is something that can be legislated? Like how open these algorithms have to be, whether Facebook should be publishing its recommendation algorithm or you know, should we should be regulating these sort of like escape hatches to enable people to provide feedback? Right. So I can't off the top of my head think of good examples of recourse. GDPR does provide a lot more recourse to people. So it let it lets you, you know, demand information about how your data is being used, it lets you demand it that it be um, taken down if you, you know, if, uh, under the right to be forgotten. Um, th there's a bunch of forms of recourse built into GDPR, but like I said earlier, the problem with it is that it's predicated on the idea that you know that there's a problem that you want recourse for. And I think before you have recourse, you have to solve the problem of knowledge. So if, you know, if your Facebook data is being used to influence um, the prices that you're offered on car insurance, which I don't know if that actually happens, but it's a very plausible kind of scenario these days. Um, how do you know that that's happening? Um, even if there is a law that says that you, you need to be able to get that information should you ask for it, how would you know to ask for it? So I think that all of these models of recourse, there has to be a conversation about um, not only giving people uh, the right to demand recourse or to see their data or to see how their data is being used, but also about how do you help people find out that they're, you know, and who has responsibility for that? Who, who essentially is responsible for, for, for protection of people? And that's a tricky one because then it, then it starts to get into questions of the nanny state and uh, risk, you know, limitations on, on industry. P people get very fired up about this, about this thing, the idea that you have to protect people. But I think that given the complexity of data management issues, of knowing what you're what's happening with your data, I don't think you can expect people to, to take care of their own interests um, entirely, and so you have to you have to talk about mechanisms for for helping them understand when their interests are when things are going against their interests. And I don't see a lot of talk about that right now. No, of course, we're completely unique. Um, no, look, a lot of people are writing about the, about the social issues around technology. Um, uh, you know, um, Julia Angwin and Jeff Larson, who are at ProPublica, are launching uh, a news outlet this next year, and I've momentarily forgotten the name, but they're looking, they launched this specifically, sorry? The Markup. The Markup, that's right. Um, and, but they're launching it specifically to look at questions of um, how technology, uh, uh, the harms of technology. So I frame what we're doing slightly differently from that. I say we're not, just, we're not about the harms of technology. We're not just there to say, oh, this is terrible, this is harmful. We are there to look at, the w look at what drives technology decisions, what makes it have harmful outcomes, what makes it have beneficial outcomes, and how you tilt more towards the beneficial. Um, and I don't think that any other media outlet has made that explicitly its, its mission. Um, and as I say, I think we can do that because being part of MIT allows us, to, gives us a certain amount more leeway to, to take on that, explicitly that kind of mission. I think there is. Um, 
Yes, I mean, I think there is. I think it depends on the model that you build. Um, it doesn't have to be that a, that a network is based in is based entirely on that. I mean, Zainab Tafekci in her story talks about one example. She says, you know, it should be possible for you, you know, if I'm interested in diving, um, it should be possible for, you know, to, for you to know that I am interested in diving without having you track every single thing I do online. Um, there, are, there are ways to make that happen. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's, it's kind of about where, you, where, where the needle is on the scale where, uh, and what policies the, the social network sets for itself. Where, what, what the business model looks like for that network, I don't know, it depends. I, know. I think these th things have to be tried out, but there's been this, this sort of, um, especially from Silicon Valley, there's been this kind of narrative of like, oh, this is just the way it is. This is the way the tech is created. There are no alternatives. Um, and I don't, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, the, like, like a million studies showing that like Americans have like awful information literacy from like the age of like zero, um, and I was kind of wondering why you think that is. Like, do we just think like we should address the adults first before the kids, or like education system just too broken to like deal with it, or like, cause like one thing I, I like my instinct is that like if we would you know if everyone was taught how to deal with this like how to like, evaluate the end that you're getting critically mm -hmm. from your age, it would be like less of a problem downstream. Just, like still there's like, a ton of factors, but I guess none of the conversation ever. I don't know nearly enough about the education system <laughs> to really say anything intelligent about that. I mean, um, the one the one like data point I'll throw in is there was a story, a piece that um, Dana Boyd wrote uh, a few months ago. Dana, she she runs something called the Data and Society Research Institute in New York. Um, I did a fellowship there. And they, they look at the, the social impacts of technology, essentially. And she, she has a thesis that um, something in the way that critical thinking has been taught in American schools um, has caused people to, has, has engendered this sort of mistrust in authoritative sources because people are taught to question everything, to apply their own judgment, um, and that, but th this, this leads to a situation where they don't really differentiate between what is a, a good source of information and what's a bad one. That, that's like her opinion. I, I, I don't know anything more about it. So other, one, other than that, I can't really, I can't really say. Yeah. That was another. Um, so you mentioned AI during this talk, but I'd love to know um, some of the other uh, emerging technologies or trends or even possible trends that you're sort of keeping a close eye on that you think it might have big impacts for democracy and journalism. Oh, for democracy and journalism. Hmm. Um, let's see. I mean, well, I guess this is still AI to some extent, but I mean, the automation of work in general, um, in other words, not the impact of AI on, on communication, which is what I've been talking about today, but the impact of AI on the workforce um, is going to have a huge effect. It already is having an effect because, you know, as it, as it impacts where jobs are created and uh, the, the distribution of wealth, um, and that, you know, that affects um, politics. Politicians are having to respond to workers who feel like the, the robots took their jobs away. Um, so that that's a very big impact. Um, you know, in our, uh, I, I think that more tangentially, these issues like precision medicine um, have some so have an effect because they raise questions of who has access to healthcare, what is a minimal level of healthcare, what is a reasonable use of genetic editing, for instance, um, is it. You know, is it okay to gene edit um, a uh, an embryo for, in, for IVF to remove uh, genetic disease from a family's line? Um, most people would say yes, but what if not everybody has access to that, and you end up with um, some people? You know, it's a rather Gattaca-like scenario. You end up with some people who have had genetic disease edited out of their families, and some people who have not. Um, what is you know what is the what is the what are the social equities there, and who who gets to decide whether or not that is an acceptable technology? I mean, th those all become political issues, obviously, as well. So, in addition to um, moving to print, as you're in her, um, <laughs> these themes you choose, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see your publication moving this conversation forward? I mean, do you have a long-term strategy? seen this 
issues are the first step. Mm -hmm. um, there are then conferences at MIT that, that roll out. There's a TV show, there are podcasts. And, mm -hmm. and then how do you get this conversation out into the level of, so it's not in the stratosphere of MIT and Stanford, but to the, to the public sphere? Yeah. So I think that's something that we work out as we go along. So yes, the print-themed issues allow us to go deeper into a subject and to hopefully engender conversation around it. In some cases, we do events. We may do events that are related to those. Um, so as it happens this year, we, we, we had a, a special issue on blockchain and another one on uh, automation and the economy, and we had conferences on those topics. Um, that at, but, at MIT? Um, yes, at MIT. So that won't happen every time, but that's something that happens. Um, we... You know, we, we think about how can we measure the impact that the stories we do are having. That's a difficult one, but you know, there, there are things that we could use maybe as proxy indicators to show this story is having an impact, it's being picked up, it's being discussed in certain circles. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe podcasts is, is one way that we do it. It, it. But I think it's something that we feel out as we go along. Um, we don't have like a master plan for, for changing the world's mind, unfortunately. One last question. I have a rather basic question, which is um, how, how in, the, in the ecosystem of technology uh, knowledge publication, where does MIT tech review sit as compared to Wired or The Verge? Mm -hmm. like so I think most of those are more focused on, A, on gadgets on technology, on the, on the culture around technology. I mean, you know, gamer culture and so on, online culture. Um, I mean, they also cover some of the same issues that we cover as well. But we don't really do the, the gadget stuff. We don't do the, the culture stuff. We don't do stuff about funding, about venture capital very much. We don't do a lot of the Silicon Valley shenanigans. Um, so. I guess you could say we're more focused on on those on the I the issues around technology that I'm that I'm talking about. Okay, really the last question. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna figure out how to ask it quickly. Um, you, I, I guess, I think a lot about um, uh, you know this movement that we're in from very top-down journalism. The, in other words, where, where, where will question, checks and balances come from? The question is, how do we continue to empower you know, diverse groups of localized storytellers but mm -hmm. without sort of eroding the, the trust that mainstream media purported to provide? I mean, I don't think those two things are necessarily in conflict, right? I mean, I think that you can, I think you could use local storytelling very effectively, in fact, to provide more checks and balances if it corresponds to the need of, needs of a local community. So I think that there's still a lot to be explored in the ways in which, in which new media organizations can serve a community, figure out what the business model is for serving a community, and do the accountability and the community building stuff that media organizations traditionally did. The, you know, the bigger problem, I think, is for the more traditional outlets that always had this role of, okay, we, we set some kind of terms for the national conversation. If half the country doesn't believe what it reads in those outlets, then how do you have a conversation at the national level about grand about bigger political issues and that i don't i don't know the answer to that i don't think we found it yet okay unfortunately we're out of time thank you so much